Hello and welcome to Deep Fakery and also MIT Open Documentary Lab's first public talk of the semester. My name is Sarah Wallison. I'm the director of the MIT Open Documentary Lab. And throughout the fall and spring semesters on Tuesdays, we host a lecture series and Q&A at the intersection of documentary, arts, journalism, and technology. And we invite you to join us. Today, it's my great honor to launch our series for the semester with a discussion about a pressing topic for us at the lab, and I'm sure for all of you, deep fakes. This is a special presentation between the co-creation studio here at the lab and the human rights group, Witness. It's part of our joint ongoing series called Deep Fakery, Satire, Human Rights and Journalism in a Time of Infodemics. We'll be here for a total of 90 minutes today in a deep dive with filmmaker David France in conversation with Kat Cizek for about 50 minutes, followed by questions from the Open Documentary Lab and Witness, and then we'll open it up to you for questions. Enjoy, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to two of the curators of the Deep Fakery series, Corin Fife of Witness and Kat Cizek of the Co-Creation Studio. Thank you. Great, thanks, Sarah. So this is the third episode of the Deep Fakery series. And as Sarah mentioned, it's co-presented by Witness, a human rights organization that helps people use video and technology to secure social justice. A major focus for us recently has been how to better prepare for deep fakes. Um, you can learn more about that work at uh, a link that we'll show on screen. But we've also had a long-standing interest in how to protect vulnerable activists and eyewitnesses who appear on video. So this episode of the series really connects with that part of our mission. For those who are not already familiar with deepfakes, we're talking about new ways to use artificial intelligence to manipulate video and make it, make it look like someone said or did something that they never did through editing audio, uh, swapping faces, simulating voices, and otherwise manipulating scenes. But deepfakes can be used for good, as we'll see. Uh, this episode is called Using AI-Generated Face Doubles in Documentary, Welcome to Chechnya. And my colleague, Kat, will be in conversation with the director of this powerful new film. Thanks, Corin. Two and a half years ago, a Reddit user unleashed images of Nicolas Cage's face, deep faked onto the bodies of famous characters in Hollywood films. When some viewers saw this, they laughed. Others were horrified by the potential negative implications of this technology. But our guest today, filmmaker David France, saw something different. He saw a tech that could be uh, a big solve for a very big problem for him. He saw that it could serve as a witness protection program for the subjects of a documentary he'd been filming undercover for years. That film is called Welcome to Chechnya. And in a world first, David and his team have used AI generated face doubles to protect the identities while humanizing the stories. The film premiered at Sundance this year and is now touring the world to acclaim. In fact, it just won a prize in Warsaw. Congratulations, David. It's my pleasure to introduce you to, uh, to David, an Oscar nominated filmmaker, New York Times bestselling author, an award winning film, uh, award winning investigative journalist. You may remember him from his 2012 film, How to Survive a Plague, which garnered Academy and Emmy nominations, as well as a Peabody Award. David joins us today from a basement. Uh, with a breakdown of this amazing story of how they use deepfakes for good. Hi, David. Mm -hmm. Hi, Kay. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And thanks, Corin. It's great to have you. And uh, we'll start uh, with a trailer and a clip of, uh, of the film, but uh, maybe set that, that us, uh, up for us uh, by telling us why you made this film. Well, um, uh, uh, I'm excited to show some of this footage here, but... Um, I started reporting on the story um, in 2017 when I first heard about the disaster that was happening against the LGBTQ community in Chechnya. And I've spent most of my career uh, in print journalism before going into documentary filmmaking, covering LGBTQ issues as an investigative reporter. Um, and I felt that it was important to uh, continue to expose what was happening um, to the community uh, in the south of Russia. And um, so I just kind of leapt into it, never having had reported in Russia before and never having had to deal with a visual medium that required um, 
people's uh, anonymity. So it was a, a great number of challenges that I took on and, um, uh, and a, a steep learning curve for me. Um, but I, I, I think you'll see um, what the dangers were when you see the trailer and the clip. Практически сразу было решение принято о том, чтобы людей спасать, эвакуировать. У нас не было такого опыта, нужно же людей скрывать, нужно их искать им визы, какие-то пути, тайны, вывоза из страны. Бегом, бегом, бегом. Ах, все, у меня, короче, паника начинается. Они будут искать. Я это прекрасно все знаю. Я не буду делать все, чтобы это никогда не всплыло. Изменить ситуацию может только человек, который прошел эти пытки и заявит об этом публично. Не буду делать всевозможные действия, чтобы закнуть меня. Когда это все начало происходить, потому что мы все понимали, что это катастрофа, что это вопрос о спасении не двух-трех людей, а сотен людей. Нужно было людей скрывать, потому что на них велась охота. Мы разработали строгие протоколы по безопасности. Сейчас мы начнем заниматься экстренным переселением. И постараемся вовлечь международное сообщество. Тут я буду, да, мы с тобой здесь будем спать. Вместе с тобой здесь будем да. спать. Здесь будем спать. Да что я тебе кровать отдам свою? Ага. Какой тип? У нас тут мексиканский сериал. That that was a scene from Welcome to Chechnya, and I'm here with the film's director David Franz. Now, from the get-go, David, you put into place very high security protocols in the filming of this, and, and that really is worthy of a documentary in and of itself. Uh, but today, we're going to be focusing specifically on identity protection for your subjects. What did you uh, promise the subjects of your film when you first met them? Well, when I, I, when I first spoke to them, I thought I could actually film them um, and include them in a film that would come out a year or two later, that by that time they would have found themselves in a, a safer place uh, and that I could um, go ahead and use their faces. And I know that they had not allowed anybody else to photograph them or to even meet them. Um, so um, uh, so I thought I could you know, talk them into that somehow. Um, and what I, what I learned from them that I did not yet understand was that this, that this uh, genocide really that has been waged against them is one of elimination not just one of, of of scaring people away so that they knew that they were being hunted around the globe and if it were known that they were alive that even by members of their own family that that would put their lives in risk no matter where they landed even if they landed in toronto or in, in paris or berlin um so the the what I've had to be able to talk to them about was ways that I might be able to shoot them still seeing their journey and covering that with a veil of some sort that would allow us to um, to see their humanity and to join them on their um, on their unhappy journey um, in ways that we could understand what it felt like and what it meant to them and um, so that they could narrate their story in the most intimate way while still protecting their anonymity and um, and so I promised them that I would find some way to cover them up and, um, and that I would continue to work with them, uh, in the process. Um, because I knew that for the most part, and you saw that in that clip, that so many of them were very young, that, um, that I wanted to make sure that I got not just consent from them, but informed consent that they understood over time what they were doing with me and what it was, what its significance was. And, um, and how that might somehow impact their lives. So that I would return to them, I had a contract with them that said that I would return to them for security reviews on the approach, security reviews on the footage that we have in the film, uh, and, um, and, and, and then on the scenes that we were proposing to use in, 
And it, it meant keeping in contact with people who were currently, even today, deep in hiding. So it was quite a challenge to promise to them and even more of a challenge to follow up on. So your first idea was to rotoscope um, your their faces. Uh, we have some of those early sketches that you were looking at as inspiration. Maybe you can tell us what you were thinking when you discovered these online. I brought this with me when I went to the shelter um, to show one approach that I might be able to use. And this is an approach where a rotoscoping technology allows the, the, the um, filmmaker to carve the individual out of a scene and just put them through a series of simple filters, reducing them to this kind of cartooning figure. And the cartoons really appeal to the people in the shelter. This little clip here shows the underlying person and you can see how, how it's really just an isolation of a figure. And so uh, literally on the contract that I had with people, I had them check off the box if they wanted to be made into a cartoon. And, and, that, um, and that did not everybody agreed to do it. Many people in the shelter felt continually unsafe and um, to the point where they were not interested in participating in any way. Um, but the people who did really thought this would be a cool thing for them. And uh, let's just set the context for post-production for you. Let's just leap ahead into post-production. And can you tell us a little bit about the security context of your entire post-production all along the way to protect your footage yeah. as well as your post-production machines? No, absolutely. It's um, So uh, with this promise, they allowed me to spend what was basically two years embedded in this underground network of shelters, recording stories, many more stories than are included in the film. Um, and, um, and, and the first challenge, knowing that I was going to have to discover, disguise them, was to find ways to, uh, to be convinced that there was no way that my footage, even having captured it, would ever land in the wrong hands. So we transferred footage immediately after shooting onto um, encrypted drives. Uh, in Russia, it's not legal to have an encrypted drive, so we were taking risks doing that. But those risks were paled compared to the risks of, you know, life and death for the people who are in the film. We then overwrote the cards from the cameras, um, not just deleting the information, but writing uh, new information over the top of it. It's a lengthy process to make sure that the cards themselves couldn't be used to to retrieve that information. Um, and then brought the footage back to the studio in New York, which we set, set up as an air-gapped studio, meaning none of the computers in the studio uh, had ever connected with the internet. Um, and uh, we kept all uh, internet-connected devices in isolation in the studio, meaning you know um, uh, Apple watches and cell phones. Um, and so we, we wanted to make sure, we knew we were working against the interests of state actors. And we wanted um, to make sure that the capacities available to the Russian government would not um, uh, allow them access to our, to our studio. Um, and we worked entirely on encrypted drives, which is a very slow process in an edit, um, especially with 4K files. So um, we, were, um, we were advised along the way by um, data security firms that we brought on as consultants, um, as well as um, physical security firms that made sure that we were safe in bringing the equipment out of the country and that we had legal representation um, every time we traveled to make sure that if anybody got caught with an encrypted drive that they would immediately have access to a criminal defense attorney. So with, with that all in place, we come back to the lab and realize we can't send the footage out to rotoscoping farms in India uh, which would be the typical approach. So we had to uh, bring people in and um, and make sure that we understood their backgrounds and and felt comfortable that they would join us on the secret mission. And we created a rotoscoping studio right inside our studio in New York. What a massive undertaking! Let's let's roll a clip of some of those early tests uh, while you explain to us, David, what we're what we're seeing. So this is a kind of a traditional rotoscope um, where just the head is taken. Um, uh, it's rudimentary um, and was fascinating to us. We were worried that it didn't do anything to disguise the character at all. 
it just made them look like a little less than human, uh, which was working against us. So we started with some filtering um, ideas that might distort some of the uh, sizes of some of the facial features. This one we called the triplets of Belleville. Um, and um, it did tend to disguise, but it also tended to dehumanize, as you can see here. Um, and we felt that this was a very important story we were telling, uh, a very emotional story, and we didn't want to step on any of that. Um, the more we filtered, the more we stepped. Um, and we started to think that there might be no way that rotoscoping was going to be useful for us. This is a version where we wrote a scope and then gave it to an artist to design over the top. Um, and, uh, and we ran out of energy there, I guess. Um, but in, in designing something like that over the top and in, in, in interposing an artist's interpretation, I felt that we were um, doing a disservice to the people whose stories were being shared in the film and who were reclaiming their own narratives, that we were instead giving it to an artist to, to tell us how they reacted. Um, and I wanted to see if there weren't a way where we could find the, 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 the truth of what they were going through without uh, recreating it. So we, we, we kept pushing. And, um, and uh, at one point, the, in one of our edits, our editor, uh, Tyler Walk, um, said that he was not, that he was very worried that we would never discover this thing. That for all the work that we had put into making this film, that we wouldn't find a way to tell the stories faithfully and genuinely uh, in a way that um, re-empowered the people who had survived this, this terrible atrocity um, and allowed them to reclaim their narratives and their own humanity. So we kept pushing on. You had a really big problem. How did you find deep fake technology? Well, we found um, the same Nicolas Cage. Uh, there's a data set of Nicolas Cage's face all over the internet. And one of the companies that we had started reaching as we were reaching further and further afield to try to find a solution, one of the companies just applied that face to uh, the body of that individual who you were watching, um, his name, in the film, his name from the shelter is Grisha. And um, they applied Cage's face to Grisha. And um, and as you said about the the earlier use of his face, it, it did make us laugh, but it also made us suddenly convinced that this was gonna be possible, that we were going to be able to disguise people without subtracting, yeah. Yeah, keep. Keep on telling us about this. This is incredible. So what did you he, think? Here, here his face, Nicolas Cage's face is being animated by Grisha. So his facial movements, his um, micro expressions, um, everything is, uh, is, is true to the underlying character in the film, to this, this survivor of torture. Um, and yet he's wearing this mask in such a way that nobody would know who he is. And, um, and we got very excited. Um, and then we asked, you know, Hollywood what it would take to do this. Um, and this is a technique that had been used uh, in other aspects. Um, uh, I think of um, um, Margot Robbie in I, Tanya. You know, there's that ice skating scene, several ice skating scenes where her face is glued over the face of the woman who is doing the, the acrobatic work. Um, and, uh, and that's really a time consuming frame by frame application. And, um, and we, we knew that, we, that that was not gonna be possible for us. So at once we thought, yes, this will be possible to show this film. No, it won't be possible for us to do this, to, to make this possible, to, to, to bring this story out. So we were, we were out of one bind and into another bind. But you started working with software developer uh, and VFX specialist, Ryan Laney. Let's hear from him uh, and uh, he'll tell us a little bit about what he started doing with you. The next step was a volunteer friend of ours sat with us and we did a, a proper facial data capture session. We then used that in a high resolution scenario 
and were able to get something that not only was quality uh, heads above what we had done before, but also a level of expression that we didn't quite expect. In this sense, there's two databases. One is of the volunteer and all their angles and expressions, and the other is of the subject in the film and all their angles and expressions. The machine makes a, an association between those. The way the machine represents the face is a bit like a memory. And what it does is it correlates the memory of a face smiling in one person with the memory of a face smiling in the other person. Every eye blink, every smile, every expression, every piece of emotion, uh, every micro expression might be a, a way to say it, um, is, uh, is translated faithfully from one to the other. From one to the other. David, you, you, what, what did you think of Ryan when you met him? <laughs> well, I thought he was a madman. Um, he said he thought he could do it. He, he said he thought he could automate this system. He could find a way around it, around the requirement of, you know, having artists do this work. And he could use artificial intelligence and deep machine learning to, um, to make this, um, uh, you know, an accessible use of technology. And here we had a film that is, you know, an hour and 47 minutes long. Um, uh, something like 80 minutes of the film have people who's, who needed disguises, 23 characters in all. And, uh, and, and he said he could do it. Um, and, you know, like we just all thought, well, we'll let him try. And he, uh, uh, and he set up a, a, we, again, we had to do this in, in secret. So we set up a, a, a secret location in Los Angeles um, with no windows to the outside where he and his team could work to build this um, software to, uh, to allow this to happen. And this was not simple work. I mean, this, the deep fake stuff that we're accustomed to seeing is almost always the, just a face talking, sitting in a chair talking and never moving around, never running for their lives, never operating in uh, suboptimal lighting, um, being filmed by iPhones and GoPros and hidden cameras, um, and never turning away from the camera. I mean, that turned out to be one of our biggest uh, complications where the face would actually, the machine would just throw the face onto a potted plant or onto the door of a building um, in confusion uh, after the person turned around. So he had a lot he had to work on. And um, and we just set him to it and said, we'll give you you know two months, two and a half months to tell us that this is possible. We worked with him on the R&D of it. And he came back and said, let's do it. So um, so we, we were about to pull the trigger. Um, and then we started having second thoughts. And the, the second thoughts were about... Um, uh, were these faces going to be relatable um, in his technology, um, and uh, and or would they risk throwing the viewer into the uncanny valley? Uh, we worried that uh, the closer we got to being, you know, a perfectly human look in this disguise, the the more we risked um, uh, alienating the audience and. Um, so once again, we worried that maybe we hadn't found our approach. And then, then we decided to take it to experts to find out what they had to say about it. So you went to Dr. Talia Wheatley at her social systems lab in Dartmouth, and um, you decided to do some research with her about how audiences and users would react to these uh, incredible face doubles you had created with Ryan. Um, can you tell us about that study? Who was in it? What were they testing for? Well, she is one of the experts in the Uncanny Valley, and they um, and and she said she had never been contacted by a, a film director before, and she was very eager to find out a, a way that she might be able to put science uh, to the task of helping to protect people who are um, in such dire th risk uh, for for their lives. And she uh, and um, and her uh, staff at, at the at her lab, set up a study with students at Dartmouth, 109 students, um, to test their emotional response to the footage. So we, because this, because Grisha, um, who we've already seen, uh, halfway through the film, 
um, goes public, we felt we could show his face more widely. And um, so we, we edited together a little clip from a press conference where he comes out and, um, and, and used that same clip in, in three subsequent ways. So we gave it to the, um, the, the people at the lab to, to respond to each of these approaches and, and tell us what their emotional um, responses were and whether or not they felt connected to and moved by the individual in the story in the clip. So let's see that first clip. Uh, this is undisguised. This is the full scene. And uh, then we'll, we'll show what, what you were testing against. То есть пока нет заявителя по нет э, нечего расследовать. Мы можем сколько угодно кричать об этом на каждом перекрестке, но пока нет э, человека, который заявит о том, что с ним это произошло, э, не начнутся расследования. Даже попытка, даже проверка. И что вот наконец-то человек который заявит, он действительно написал заявление в Следственный комитет Российской Федерации. Добрый день. Охота на геев весны этого года, когда были незаконно задержаны и подвергнуты пыткам десятки человек, остается не расследованной. Но, к сожалению, никаких активных следственных действий до сих пор не произошло. Зачем мы собрали эту пресс-конференцию? Сегодня впервые перед журналистами выступит человек, непосредственно пострадавший. Максим Лапунов. Твою историю Максим расскажет сам. Избивали по голеням, то есть спиной лицом к стене поставили, избивали по ногам, бедрам, ягодицам, по спине. То есть до момента, когда я начинал падать, они давали отдышаться, заставляли вставать, и это продолжалось несколько этапов. За это время, до того, как меня избивали, каждые там, минут 10-15 забегали в камеру с криками, все обвиняли, то есть, что я гей, что таких, как я, надо убивать. И не знаю, сколько по времени это было, но очень долго. Расскажет комитет против пыток. Единственное, чего бы я хотел на данный момент, это... Спасибо. That's Grisha undisguised. And you were testing, David, against three other versions of the same clip. Maybe we'll just uh, run those and you can tell yeah. us what we're seeing in one of them. So this is the undisguised, and we gave them that clip to watch. We assumed that that would score very well, or at least would be the, uh, kind of our gold standard. Uh, and then we used the full face swap, which is the technique that ultimately we used in the film. Um, and uh, then there was a thought that maybe we should cut the eyes through, that maybe the eyes that you're looking at here would are not crisp enough. And so we were able to use the face but retain the eyes, which you see in this image. Um, and that had the advantage of getting all the lighting right for the room. And, and then the final was an animated version to see how that would score, to see whether or not that was still an option for us, if we could figure out how to actually get the disguise to work. Um, so all four of those were shown um, in, uh, in this study. And uh, we were surprised that um, the full face swap was, in fact, the best of the emotional responses, uh, that it scored slightly, maybe statistically insignificant, but slightly higher than the undisguised face. And that the punch out so eyes was disturbing to people. I'm sorry? That was the verdict. That was that was the verdict, and and I, you know, I, I went back to the to to Professor Wheatley and said, "Why do you think that the 
the, the disguised face scored better than the other face. And she thought there might just be a, a question of uh, attractiveness or handsomeness um, as measured by the people who were in the study. Um, but they were close enough that we knew we were not risking the uncanny valley in any way by going with the full face swap. That's incredible. And you're, you're, you're publishing a paper with Dr. Wheatley on this as well. Is that correct? We are. Yeah, we, we are. We're, we're, we're talking about this is that, you know, this is the, the first time that this has been used um, in, in this way. Um, certainly the first time to protect witnesses and to protect um, people who are um, in such peril. Um, so we're, we're writing it up as a, the, so that we can understand the science of it and, and, and how the science worked. Um, and, uh, I think it's in pre-publication now, so it's, it, the paper can be read in one of the pre-pub sites. That's great. Now you had settled on a face swap solution. You figured out the technology, you figured out the emotional resonance, but now you needed some faces and you needed 23 of them. Is that what you said? Um, how did you go about recruiting and casting faces and face doubles for this film? Um, we had, um, uh, we knew that we were, you know, asking for a lot, and we knew that we couldn't ask actors to to do this. The SAG um, uh, is very concerned with the this approach, um, and we're, we weren't asking people to act. Um, we were asking people just to lend us their face so that we could create a uh, an algorithm, a data set that would allow this transfer to take place. So we started going to people who are activists um, in the social media space around LGBTQ issues, particularly around issues related to um, international queer um, solidarity uh, um, protesting. Uh, and we, um, cl we clipped their faces out and sent them to Ryan saying, will this one work for this person? Will this one work for that person? We did a lot of like pairing. We were calling it casting. We were saying, trying to find somebody whose face was dissimilar uh, in the extreme from the underlying person, but whose facial features still lined up in one way or another with the people that were being covered. Um, and we did that because we discovered that when people turn sideways, if, if their nose is longer than the volunteer's nose, it, it, it's still there. We get a double nose situation. So we were, we, we were careful to try to match them up and Ryan was giving us approvals on them. And uh, so we went to Instagram, we went to um, uh, demonstrations, we you know, approached total strangers and said, um, would you be willing to take this on as an act of activism to lend your face as a kind of a human shield to protect the identities of people in this story? And so many of the people doing Instagram activism um, are desperate for something that's a little bit more than just posting a picture. They, this gave people something to do, and we had no shortage of volunteers who the majority of, of them already established activists uh, to come forward and say, yeah, yes, I'm happy to do this. So you had uh, these face doubles, these activists who uh, were donating films, uh, donating their faces, and you had to bring them into the blue, blue screen studio. Uh, what came of that process? And we'll hear from Ryan as well about uh, what that looked like. We just had to bring them in and borrow their faces. And um, and we had to do it as economically as possible uh, and uh, with huge data files. We were doing, we were in, ingesting their images in 4K uh, videos um, from multiple angles. And um, uh, so each of them spent, for each of the scenes that they were in, gave us an hour, an hour and a half in the studio. And it was an undertaking that took eight days. Wow, eight days. Let's hear from Ryan and see what that looked like. One of the, those first two tracks we were working on was was to figure out what we needed to, uh, in, in the film, what we needed to cover as far as environments went. We had strong daylight, we had interior daylight lit, we had interior incandescent nighttime. Basically every scenario, lighting scenario you could think of we had in the, in the film, we had to represent. We rented a stage in New York in Brooklyn and did a lighting setup so that we could mimic each one of those scenarios and have the volunteers come in and sit and capture their faces from the angles that we needed for each scene. We knew we had a lot of people to cover 
and we were very concerned about timing. In order to get more angles from each person within the smallest amount of time possible, we created a camera array. We used nine cameras, DSLRs, and we arranged them in a grid so that we could capture nine times the amount of footage for every moment. This gave us a larger data set. It also hedged us against uh, making sure that we had enough coverage for something that maybe we didn't think about. This gave the machine a lot more material to work with when trying to find matches between frames in the film and this data set of the volunteer. The facial data capture sessions were really about capturing the range of motion that we would need in the film. It wasn't a, an acting or a pantomiming of what was going on in the film. It was really just a person sitting in a seat and moving around so that we could capture their face from every angle and through the different expressions. We also had them repeat a line, which is called a pangram. This is a sentence that covers all the phonemes of the English language or whatever language that we're working with um, so that we get the correct lip shapes when we're reproducing the language in the film la later. Vachasha Yuga. Jilba Citros. Da no Pashui. Pashui. And again, this is all just data for the machine so they can make a good pairing between the volunteer and the subject in the film. Data for the machine. You created a whole new system with Ryan. Can you tell us about the implications of this, this work together? Well, we have, um, and we recognized it as it was happening, that we, that we were um, creating a brand new tool for documentary filmmakers. And that, you know, I'm a relatively new documentary filmmaker um, and relatively new in the visual space. Um, uh, so I didn't at the beginning of this process know what the limitations were uh, in the ways that documentarians had solved this problem in the past. Um, and all of them had been reductive in a way. They had tended to blur or pixelate or somehow eliminate the, the, the true kind of human expression of the experiences of the people in the film. And what we have now shown is that it, it is possible in an affordable way to, um, to use this artificial intelligence and machine learning universe uh, in a way to, um, to, to allow documentary filmmakers to tell stories that otherwise would not have been tellable um, and to allow people who have suffered and continue to suffer unspeakable uh, suffering to uh, reclaim their voices and reclaim their narratives and um, and invite the world to witness what happened to them and what and what the cost of that was and um, so you know we, we we give it to the world it's uh, like you know it, um, and, and and we fully expect that it will be um, used again even in the near future um, Ryan has already begun working with other documentary filmmakers in their approaches to, to using this tool and I think that it opens up certainly in the area of social justice filmmaking um, a, a, a brand new ability to bring audiences to these intimate intimate stories of abuse absolutely the pixelization and digitization of faces thanks to reality TV and so many cop shows for so many years right. Serve to really criminalize uh, the uh, the an, an anonymized face, so it's it's really remarkable. And in fact, we have a comment from someone on Facebook who says, "This is amazing. I'm thoroughly impressed." You're right; it does preserve the humanity of the subject. How have audiences? Uh, I know that you've been mostly traveling uh, festivals online, but have you had a chance to hear from audiences about their reactions to this remarkable footage? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, that what they're reacting to is the story itself, which can be devastating and very upsetting to people and also um, can implicate them, which was one of our goals as we made this film was to to say this is a story that you who watch the film must take on um, responsibility for doing something for. And um, and I think this technique um only allows that to happen and doesn't get in the way. One of the things I wanted to make sure of as we were doing this was that um, the last adjustment that we made to the to the face double usage was to make it transparent to people who are watching the film to know who was 
who is wearing one of these face doubles and who isn't. Um, so we, we actually um, added a kind of a halo around individuals in the film so you could see that. So at, when, you, when you're introduced to them, you know that they're hiding. And um, we wanted to do that because we wanted to be honest and forthright with the people in the film um, uh, uh, who are watching the film. But uh, also it, it underscored the, the dangers in a way that they were living. And it made us recognize in scene after scene that they were taking a risk to tell their stories. Um, so I wanted to be faithful to that as well. And I think that the audiences have found a way to watch the film, knowing that that's happening and see through it to get the story that's being told. Incredible layers of visual coding for us to relate to this material in so many levels. Um, and you know, this, this technology is crudely called deep fakes. What do you think of that term now in, in the ways that you have employed it in every aspect of, of your very careful touch with this film? Well, I, I, I don't um, accept that I have been involved in the deep fake world. Um, I think deep fake is the crime, not the technology. Um, and in fact, as we were trying to um, figure out what to call this initially, I thought we should probably call it something like deep truth because it allows a truth to be told that would otherwise have been silenced forever. Um, so, uh, you know, I think it's a, I, I think we should look at all technology as having dual moral purpose. Uh, this one especially included. And I think what the, what the tool allows us to do uh, the range of things that artificial intelligence might allow us to work with and, and to accomplish might not be fully yet understood. So I have, um, I have tried to correct people in um, reviews about the film to, who want to call it deep fake to say, if, if it were deep fake, then it would be a different film altogether. That, that in fact, nothing in this film has changed except the skin that stands between you and the person who's, who's, who's telling us their truths. And there's a profound sense of consent throughout the entire process from the people that are, that, whose identities you're protecting to, to, the, um, to the people who are giving their faces to this project as well and voices. And, and to the audience. The audience is consenting to watch this technology. There's a disclaimer card at the beginning of the film that says, faces of those who are fleeing for their lives have been digitally altered. Um, and we leave it to you to, to recognize which those faces are. We don't tell you uh, until two thirds of the way into the film how they've been altered, um, just that they have been. And I think the success of the AI in this instance is that the measure of success is that people are able to watch the film as a film, um, as a piece of journalism, as a piece of storytelling uh, and understand the truth in it. And, the, and, and walk away with the messages that we, we hope that they would find in the film. This is a great time to bring in our two communities from Witness and also our Open Documentary Lab community. I'm gonna ask Sarah and, Sarah and Corin to uh, bring in some questions from all, those, uh, all our colleagues watching today. Uh, Corin, do you wanna start with the Witness question? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, I, I mean, this one is a witness question from from me as a representative of, of witness. Uh, David, I found that so fascinating to um, to hear about everything that went on behind the, the the making of that film. And one of the things that you said early on that I, I made a note of was that you had abandoned the rotoscoping techniques because you felt it didn't quite convey the truth of what was happening. Um, and I wondered, we've talked a little bit about some of the reactions the audience members had to seeing uh, those techniques, the, the deep fake kind of techniques and things. But when the people who were the, the subjects of the film saw themselves, I mean, I, I imagine that that would feel almost kind of bittersweet in a way, because on the one hand, there's this story being told, but you're also seeing yourself and what's happening to you, but with someone else's face on it that isn't your own. And I, I'd be really interested to hear um, how some of the people featured in in the movie reacted to that, and what their thoughts on it were. Uh, that's such an interesting question. You know, I neglected to say that one of the things that we did to test the disguise is to show the person disguised, a still of that person disguised, to other people who were in the shelter system 
and ask them to tell us who that person was <laughs> and or who that dog was in this instance. Um, <laughs> and, um, and, and, and if, if they couldn't tell us who that person was, we felt like we were, we had something we felt confident we could bring on to the people who were in the film. They were all um, in fact, kind of delighted um, when they first saw what we were doing um, and surprised. Um, and then when we reviewed the, the frames that they were in, the scenes that they were in, we discovered that it's not just their face that is sometimes identifiable. Sometimes we had to change their clothing. So we changed uh, jackets using just traditional VFX work. We um, eliminated jewelry or changed jewelry. We changed colors of things. We, um, we, uh, uh, we did a lot of clothing changes. And, and in one case, we actually changed the entire head because there was something about the shape of the person's head that was so unique that we were afraid that that, that alone might be a, a, a giveaway. Um, and then as the film has come out, I've traveled with some of the people in the film uh, and, and have watched it with them over and over and over and over. And they talk about how they, um, they're they able to watch the film, sometimes even forgetting that that's them in the film, which I find really surprising. And, um, and one of the people um, specifically felt like, um, uh, he was uh, a, a little uh, upstaged by the face that we gave him. Um, and he was happy to have been portrayed as uh, even more handsome than he was. So there's a, a kind of a lot of really personal response to it, um, but also an understanding, especially for those who have been in an audience with the film before the lockdown, uh, an understanding of how powerful their stories are and how the, this technique has allowed their stories to have that kind of power. They're able to walk through the lobbies afterwards and not be recognized by anybody and just really experience the, the, the kind of emotional journey that their story is now on as it rolls out through the world. Thank you. Sarah, do you have a question from our community at ODL? Yeah. First, David, I just wanted to thank you for this incredible work. And, you know, it's so true that it's not about the technology, it's how you use it. And you're, it's, it's so inspiring and important how you're showing, how you're using it. And we have a lot of questions from our lab. Take the first one from Joanna Wright. Uh, thank you for sharing this important project. My question is around the practicalities of working with so many speculative FX processes. What did this mean in terms of production time funding? And in each iteration, did you go back to the contributors to get the responses to their new representations? And did that impact the decisions you made in any way? Thank you, Sue. That's a great question. I'll start with the, the iterations. The, um, we only went to uh, the subjects in the film after we had worked with the uh, Dartmouth Lab after we knew that what we were proposing to them would have the power to do what they needed it to do, which we kept calling disguise at the highest standard, um, which is that even their own mothers wouldn't recognize them. And uh, so it, it wasn't until that point that we went to them, but certainly we went to them before pulling the trigger on poor Ryan and his uh, people at his uh, studio, um, because we didn't want them charging down some alley that we weren't going to be able to um, rescue the film from. And um, the start to finish, including this lengthy R&D period that we engaged in, uh, the process took about a year uh, and added um, probably nine months or 10 months to the post-production schedule. So it did delay us. It was relatively costly. It, uh, the the R&D itself was probably seventy or $80,000, which is a lot of money for a, an independent documentary. Um, and, uh, uh, but ultimately what, what we've created is something that can be used very cheaply. And, uh, and that's, Ryan um, has the, uh, the IP on the, that work. Um, anybody now knowing that it's possible to create could create the same thing. Um, and uh, hopefully there'll be a, a proliferation of uh, VFX, um, artists who see the importance of putting VFX, which is usually used so trivially in Hollywood, um, to such um, 
some serious mind in use. I'm just going to remind viewers that uh, you can drop your questions into uh, your social channels and we'll pick them up and bring them to David. Uh, but I'm going to turn to Corin now for more witness questions. Yeah, thanks. So um, uh, in discussing this series with, uh, with Sam Gregory, the, the uh, witness program director, he was um, asking about the, uh, well, Witness has done a lot of work on uh, face, face blurring tools and to what extent they should be incorporated into mainstream social media platforms. So, you know, Facebook and Twitter and, uh, and YouTube, in fact, has recently come out with a, an option to blur faces. Um, I wonder where you stand on that, having having clearly gone through such a complex, uh, time intensive, you know, research intensive process to do this. Um, do you think that we should see more of these tools being incorporated into more casual apps, into social media platforms and, and so on? Um, or, or do you think perhaps that it is too difficult to implement with the kind of security level that you're trying to work at? Well, I. You know, I, I don't know that I truly understand the security issues on the social media front. Um, but the, the area that I think that we have pioneered is one that involves um, a, an intense amount of challenging on that question of consent. Um, do people want to be in pictured or, or, or visible? Um, do they want their identities known? Um, and to what level um, will uh, an obscuring of their identity be uh, acceptable to them? And I think that uh, if that's what is being discussed in, uh, on, the, on the social media sites, um, I would imagine it would be a, a hard thing to police and, um, and, and get right. But I think it gives people the opportunity, I think, to kind of reclaim their anonymity in some ways, which I think would be... Um, of uh, 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 ethical um, significance. Sarah, back to you. Okay, another question from William Uricchio. First, congratulations. It's powerful and important work. My question is about limits. If maintaining a person's affect and emotional appeal is the goal, what are the ethical limits to improving performances, to making characters more vulnerable or likable? It seems to me that there is a slippery slope, avoiding the uncanny valley as well as the technical challenges you mentioned, and yet also being aware of the danger of enhancing or fine tuning a performance to meet the dramaturgical needs of the film. What are your thoughts about negotiating this space? That's a very good question. I was um, I was uh, insistent that um, anything that we do in the creation of this film avoid uh, enhancing performance, and um, that's why I was worried about that use of the kind of artist's rendering over the um, whited out um, image of the individual in the frame. That I thought that that allowed for um, you know it allowed it allowed for an intervention that I didn't think as a journalist uh, would be, should be permitted in this environment. The, um, this approach using these face doubles um, is incapable of altering performance. Um, it, it does, as Ryan pointed out in his video, this memory association, it finds a blinked eye and puts it over a blinked eye. Um, the one area, as I pointed out much earlier, was that um, where I think that maybe an audience hasn't changed reaction is to their kind of, I don't know, um, romantic appeal to the image of the person whose new face is being used. And, uh, and in, in some way, that alone does change performance. Um, but there was little I could do about that um, uh, because any face would be different and would would trigger a different sort of emotional response. So we'd be, be, just because I was using real faces, they would perform in the world the way real faces do and, and trigger the same kind of emotional response to them. So that's the only area where there's a performance change. We haven't talked at all about um, voice and it is possible to use the same AI and machine learning to 
replace one voice with another. Um, that technology seemed too far away from us to be able to, to count on for this film. So there are some voices in the film who, which, who had accents that needed disguising. And um, the only way we found to do that was through a traditional uh, uh, additional dialogue recording or a looping of someone else's voice in. And we did that through um, mimicry, again, using activists, not actors. They would listen to a sentence and repeat the sentence, listen to the sentence and repeat the sentence, um, and, and trying their best to give exactly the same performance. Um, and, and we did that to, I, I think there are eight or nine people whose voices, maybe 10 people whose voices have been changed in that way in the film. A lot of people have been asking about the voice treatment in uh, in the YouTube and Facebook channels. Um, so just to reiterate, David, you did not use AI tech to to change the voices. It was really more of a traditional ADR approach. That 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 is correct. Um, we tried using um, again the the standard tricks of the trade, which are you know kind of digital. Um, plucking out of certain aspects of the range of a voice. And we couldn't do that in any way that didn't make their voices sound machine-like. And, um, and that cr created a barrier to this kind of hu human response to the individual that we were looking for. Um, so uh, ultimately we substituted in these new voices. Now, because they're um, uh, repeating the exact lines that are in the film, there's, there's no way that could change those lines because the mouth is, still mouthing those lines. So they had to um, repeat them in such a way that we could sync them in with the faces of the people whose voices were by necessity being hidden. Corin, question from Witness. Yeah, so at Witness, we're, we're very big on sharing best practices around uh, documenting uh, you know, in, in general, using video as evidence, obscuring people's identities and so on. So I really liked hearing about the way that you were co-publishing this this paper on some of the techniques you used. Um, I wondered if you'd done anything else to, to uh, I mean, besides, I suppose, this conversation to share any of the best practices around what you did. And uh, then moving on from that, do you think this is going to become a, a much more common technique in documentary film? The, um, that's, that's a really great question. You know, we we started to work from the very beginning of this project with Doc Society, which is a uh, documentary uh, film funder in the UK, um, and they have uh, created a, a, a safe and secure uh, filming um, strategy and protocol, uh, proposing that to be a standard for the industry. And they worked with us to create a kind of a real world. Um, um, practicum for their uh, uh, their ideas, um, and we have been feeding back to them uh, all of the information about our approach, um, and that will be included and incorporated in in, in future editions of their safe and secure um, documentary filmmaking uh, protocols booklet. In fact, Sarah Rafsky, who now works there, uh, did a phenomenal. Um, uh, story about your work, about all the security measures that you took, including uh, the filming process and the undercover stories that you put into place. Um, and Sarah uh, published that, I think, in Filmmaker Magazine, and she was a graduate student at our lab. So, yeah, check that out for sure. Sarah, do you have a question? Also her, her father was in my first film, How to Survive a Plague. That's right. So that's how I met her years ago. And she's in that film, too, I should point out, as a four-year-old uh, or something. Uh, uh, Plague, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. She is. Long, <laughs> long. Sarah. All right, yeah. So there um, is a same question from two people, Amber Lopez and Asia Bandai. Were there any consequences for the activists who lent their faces to the film? That, that's such a good question. You know, the answer is no. I was, I was going to say obviously is no, because... Um, the, f the film came out in, you know, was premiered in January um, and almost immediately was, you know, knocked around by the pandemic. So th the folks who are in the film, the people who are the activists who, um, who have taken on this risk, have not traveled with the film as much as we thought that they would to discover whether or not there was any 
feeling of kind of tension uh, or negative feedback. Uh, the few festivals that we were able to attend before being sent home, um, we attended with um, significant um, uh, security uh, services in place to make sure that um, that the people who were attending would be uh, safe. And we received some threats, we received some warnings, um, but um, uh, nothing ever transpired. And since then, everybody's been in a basement, as I'm in a basement. So um, um, we think that maybe uh, that may have preempted some of the negative feedback. There is something that's not an exact match between the original, uh, the, the donor face, the face double face, and the one you see in the film. There's, the, it's hybridized in a way by having been stretched over the facial structures of the underlying character, the original character, the survivor of the, uh, the abuse. Um, so there's there's something that makes it um, impossible to know for sure that the face of the activist and, and that face in the film are exactly the same. And some of them changed even more dramatically than others. One of the one of the things uh, the other group, uh, another group that you made a very quick reference to uh, in, in one part of your presentation and discussion was SAG, the Screen Actors Guild which witnesses had had some interaction with on the topic of deepfakes. And so for for kind of obvious reasons, they are concerned about the, what deepfakes could mean for acting on screen. And I wondered, having done all of this work, which clearly is using deepfakes for a, a very much needed, um, a really beneficial purpose, do you also have sympathy with that view from, from SAG? What are your thoughts on how deepfakes could impact the work of actors in the future? Um, the, their concern, um, which I think is an interesting one, is that um, a, a SAG actor can sit for an hour in a photo session, as we were doing in the blue screen universe, and go on to perform uh, in a feature length documentary through this digital process. So they, to them, that is considered a performance, um, not a photo session, um, and that the actor should be paid for the for the part, uh, not f for the hour, um, which, which is very interesting. And there's dispute among members about how significant, how si significant that might be. Um, more concerning to them is the use of dead actors. Uh, and you can scour a, a footage of a, a, you know, a very successful actor and, and create the same data set the kind of Nicolas Cage data set, but you can create it so richly that it would have all the lighting angles that we were recreating in our photo sessions. Um, and so you could reanimate Betty Davis, for example, and she could go on to have another 20, 30, 40 year career well past her death. And that's a great concern to the union and to the guild because um, they they want to um, control that um, and and, uh, and also protect the 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 estate for Betty Davis and others, um, and that's something that has not yet been uh, settled. And so, I think in both of these cases, there's a lot to discuss, and it's really about ownership of one's performance, of one's face, of one's likeness, um, and of um, uh, participation in whatever a, a film project is being developed as a result. And on, on that note, I should just I should just plug David uh, Deep Fakery episode five coming up in about two weeks time th Thursday September twenty fourth where we'll be talking specifically about archives the use of deep fakes on archival footage um, you know re reanimating footage of uh, of people who are are now dead whether famous or just everyday people and how do we get into the ethics of that so um, yeah you tune into that to hear more of this discussion. It's in business, right? Huge business. And this whole idea of screen time versus millions of art artifacts of, of your identity, those just right. blow uh, blow the, the, the questions out of the water in a way. Sarah, do you have questions from, from the lab? 
So a uh, question from Anita Rowe. Thank you for identifying this fine line between satire and hate, misinformation versus hidden information. And another question from Tara Roberts. It's very impressive and innovative. And I'm wondering how replicable this model is for filmmakers without backing from big funders. I imagine that this is an insanely expensive to produce. Um, now I know you say you're trying to make something replicable, but still, what is what is the cost ar around this? Well, the cost will only go down um, because the R and D has been done, um, and certainly anybody could um, go to Ryan and and his lab and his studio and contract with him, as other people have already done, um, to use versions of this in their in their work um, uh, at a much more affordable level than it was for us and people who are trying to find this new way to do it. Um, it, it I don't know the, the technical answer to how Ryan did it. Um, I don't know what his machines were learning in that deep way or how he was helping them to make that possible. Um, but my, my belief is that Ryan is a, a genius. Um, and uh, an incredible VFX artist, but that um, if he can do it, others can do it. And uh, that this is going to be something that I hope in some way that um, we start seeing in a regular way in documentary filmmaking and other um, filmmaking and witnessing that, um, that, that, that uses artificial intelligence to empower people, that, that, that um, we'll, we'll find a way to make this possible and make pe make it possible for people to tell their own stories. One of the big questions that we have at the co-creation studio is this relationship between artist and the machine, making with the machine, co-creating with it. And I know that you had Ryan as your mediator between you and the machine, but uh, as, as, as a documentarian, how, how were you co-creating with the machine, do you think, or, or was it just a tool for you? Um, that's an interesting question. If if I understood the machine, I might be able to claim a, a, a more of a role in it. Um, it was uh, it was not just a tool. I knew that what Ryan was doing was uh, pushing technology in a way that spoke to him. Uh, and he talks. He comes from some of the biggest VFX films in the last twenty years, and his IMDb credits are extensive and. He has never had the opportunity to use any of those tools for good. And um, for him, this was, um, you know, a, a dive into the ethics of his own work and to, to find a way to use that, what he knew how to use for Batman uh, for these folks who are superheroes in their own right um, and to uh, allow them to take a stage uh, through this film and to to show who they are and and to tell their stories and for for him that was an immensely important move and I and I know that he had to meld with his machinery in ways that he had never done before in order to make that happen. Sarah, more questions from the lab. Okay, sure. Um, from Nadav Asur. Thank you for your ethical leadership and important work. The security practices and covert practices you mentioned seem reminiscent of protocols adopted by intelligence organizations. Have you had interactions with such groups, whether private or state-based, in terms of seeking to co-opt your tools and methods, and or have you noticed any such practices emerging anywhere in this world? That's an interesting question. I, in fact, it's the other way around. We brought in um, numerous, actually three separate um, uh, security advisors, um, two of them with some background in, in, in state security and intelligence. Um, and uh, they advised us on the three key aspects of our filmmaking. Um, the first being data security, as I talked about before. The second being security for the people making the film, me and my crew as we traveled. Um, and, and the third was safety and security for the people in the film. And although they had their own security protocols, we wanted to make sure that nothing we did um, broke through those protocols or disturbed them in any way um, and made their lives more dangerous. And so we, we called upon people with expertise in those worlds 
um, to help us set up our, our protocols. And, um, uh, and uh, I, I don't think that there's anything that we've given them back uh, except for the, this kind of real life experience of, of, um, uh, of the work that we were doing in Chechnya and Russia. Um, regarding the motive for deep fakery and or misinformation, specifically regarding health, COVID in particular, targeted towards certain communities, specifically the black community, while there are more clear motives such as creating chaos and division for political purposes, for example, the false dichotomy of killing black men versus law and order, staying in place versus working for wages, what are some of the underlying motives for that which is health related like COVID? I think this is a little different from what you're dealing with. But if you have any yeah, thoughts. I mean, well, I, I do have a, a lot of thoughts about disinformation, um, and uh, yeah, and you know, and this is not entirely unrelated to the film that we were creating. I was, we were worried with this film that we would be subject to a disinformation campaign by the Russian government uh, because of these alterations that we made, um, and so far, um, fortunately, that hasn't happened. But um, uh, so we we spent some time kind of preparing ourselves to respond to disinformation, which needs an aggressive response. Um, and we were in, in, and are in place to do that. And, and unfortunately, so so few people were already in place to be encountering the kind of disinformation that's coming out of the our US federal government that, um, that it has taken on an incredibly powerful life. And, um, uh, and it, it's just going to require an equal and opposite force to to be able to 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 put that away, um, and maybe it's going to take a generation even to put that away. And that that's what I worry about in the COVID universe, where we see um, the the undermining of science to the degree that science itself can't be used as a de defense of science, and without the the possibility to use truth to argue truth then, and because truth it itself has been eliminated through disinformation, um, it's a, it, it puts everybody at a, a disadvantage and it, it, it creates a, a very unsure path through that. Um, we, we addressed truth in the film um, over and over and over. We knew that what we were telling was a, a true story that, has not, that had not been told before and it, it had not been told because of the limitations on the people who had the stories to tell, and we wanted to open up that truth, um, and, uh, uh, and in a way that that countered the disinformation that was already going on in Russia, which is that this was not happening, and the proof of it not happening is that nobody had come forward to say that it had happened, except to human rights workers and lawyers, but never personally. And we wanted to show that that that, that there was this truth that uh, undermined the official story. Um, and that's, that's an essential campaign of journalism um, and, uh, and documentary filmmaking as well. How has the film been received in Russia? Uh, it's been very interesting. You know, we, we dropped the trailer in June and it went um, within 36 hours to a million views in Russia, uh, which showed that there was an in intense hunger for this story, um, uh, both positive one imagines and negative. Um, and then after the film dropped on June 30th on HBO, it was immediately um, pirated in Russia and um, on multiple platforms. And it went to number six on the charts for popular films in the country, even as a bootlegged kind of YouTube and social media distributed uh, film. Um, uh, and that was um, uh, surprising, and um, and again showed the the interest in a true story about what's happening in Russia, which is something that's almost impossible to get there. You can't show a film in Russia that hasn't been licensed to be shown, and to get licensed, you have to go through the federal uh, censorship board for it, and. Um, uh, and you cannot show stories about that that seem to endorse uh, LGBTQ people. Um, that is considered uh, queer propaganda, 
and it's outlawed by federal law and now enshrined in the newly amended constitution for the Russian Federation. So there's so many ways that the, the government keeps people from getting real information um, that the fact that we were able to find an audience so vast and so stealthily was, was, uh, was very interesting to us. And was there a lot of media coverage? In There's been a ton of coverage in Russia, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, and uh, almost all of it positive. Uh, the Kremlin was asked to comment, and the spokesperson for uh, Putin said that, um, acknowledged knowing about the film, uh, but said that they were way too busy to watch documentary films. They were running a government, um, which makes me think that they had plenty of time to watch this documentary film. Um, and the uh, Chechen leader, Ramzan Kadyrov, has also spoken about it in dismissive ways, uh, but we've forced them to respond with the film. And, uh, but we also, and I think more um, positively, we forced Washington to respond with the film. Um, 30, 36 hours, 72 hours after we showed the film to Capitol Hill with Congressman Steny Hoyer introducing the film to, uh, to lawmakers and policymakers, uh, the State Department finally, three years after this uh, atrocity began, finally issued sanctions against the Chechen leadership, uh, and that was in August. So um, the, the 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 tool, if you will, of these face doubles has allowed this to happen, and has allowed and has forced people to make uh, public statements about these events in ways that they've evaded and avoided for the last three years. And meanwhile, the work on the ground continues. It does. It continues. And, and made a little bit more difficult by the choice of the activists in Russia to use their real faces and not go um, in disguise in the film. Um, they felt it was important that they stand up and come out from the shadows um, and, uh, you know, and own their work and, uh, and, and, and invite the world to become familiar with their faces in a way that gives them additional protection for the work that they're still doing inside Russia. It makes it uh, more difficult for people to take arbitrary government action against them. Um, and, so, and they invited that. Uh, but it also means that they're having to switch people out of certain functions that David is Steve in the film cannot be David is Steve on the ground anymore the way he was for so many years so bravely. Um, but um, for them, it was a choice of, uh, of using their own faces um, as an act of politics and, and as a way to, to communicate a story forcefully. There's a question from Asia um, Van Dijen. Do you think it's possible to reverse engineer the AI deep truth image and strip down the layers to reveal the true identity of the vulnerable subject? That's a very, very good question, um, and uh, one that many people have asked us. Uh, there are no layers. What what we have released is, uh, you know, a digital file, um, which is, you know, like a print. It's a digital print um, that um, that no longer bears any of the original character in it, um, and you could use AI to swap in a new face altogether, but you can't go and um, delete the, the work that's been done and, and find any underlying images. So we, we were very careful about that. And um, still to this day, none of those images that we shot have ever moved across the internet in any way. Uh, and they remain what versions of them we have left. They remain um, deeply encrypted and inaccessible to, to anybody. Great. And I, I would venture also from a technical point of view that something that would make it more difficult to try and reverse engineer it is in fact that you've used different actors for each for each face. So there isn't really a large enough data set to try and make any inferences about how the face is, is transferred. Whereas if there had been, if you had been trying to generate faces, again, using artificial intelligence, or you'd being able, you'd been mapping one face onto different people, um, and then it, it might have been more possible. But this, this decision to make it a one-to-one -one pairing of um, actors and the, uh, the documentary subjects would kind of ensure the security there. 
I think it might. And you saw the the version that we did using filtration that enlarged noses and eyes and changed uh, and distorted people's features. That might have been reversible because that's really an over the counter software program that does that. Um, yeah. Uh, although no one, uh, to my knowledge, has ever tried to reverse it, um, but um, one imagines that a facsimile of the underlying character might be um, retrievable in that way. But when you do a when you do an actual face replacement, it, it's it's just not. Okay, I'm just reminding viewers to drop their questions if you have any. We still are open for you, and um, I think Sarah, you have more from the lab. Yeah, another question from the lab is how do you, do you ensure your own safety while making this film? That's a, that's a good question. I talked a little bit about the the safety and security consultants that we brought in. Um, one of the key things that um, that we did for for the crew was to make sure that anytime we entered a dangerous situation. Um, or, or a situation that could possibly involve danger that we had created for ourselves a deep and rich cover story for what we were doing that had nothing to do with the work of the activists or the flight of the individuals for, to, towards safety. Um, so we were, um, we were well rehearsed. We, um, for example, and there, there's a scene in the film where, uh, a young woman named Anya is being extracted from a very dangerous situation in Grozny, the capital of Chechnya. Um, and I was there as part of a filming team, filming with my cell phone, uh, but filming in such a way that uh, made it seem that I was a, a tourist who was uh, selfie obsessed while capturing this footage. And um, and what we were in, indeed taken into uh, for questioning by the Chechen authorities at one point, not because we were filming, but because um, when we hit a checkpoint, they were surprised to see that an American was in the region. And um, and we just unfolded this cover story that we had um, devised, but also rehearsed. And um, and that story was that I was there uh, as a uh, um, kind of an over-the-top fan of the Egyptian football team that had just recently traveled through Chechnya. And I was following in their footsteps. And I um, had a burner telephone that I used to create uh, the images of that obsessed uh, football fan um, and used those images to, to as, as kind of my bona fides as I was explaining my mission. And um, it, was a, it was absurd enough, uh, but also deeply documented well enough that I was not held long and, uh, and that any risk of discovery was really minimized by that. So. It was, um, these, these were some of the security ep, uh, efforts that were suggested to us by, by um, both Doc Society and by the people that we brought in as, as, uh, as advisors. We have a question from YouTube, from somebody watching on YouTube. How are subjects able to reclaim their narrative and feel empowered while feeling a visual and physical disconnect from their on-screen self? Really appreciate the thought and care used for the participants. That's, that's so interesting. You know, I think that they reclaim their narratives and their humanity just by sitting in front of the camera. And um, that is, tr you know, transferred to an audience through the, the, the pipeline of this artificial intelligence approach. Um, but they, their humanity um, and, 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 and really difficult narratives, their stories, their histories, um, are um, are spelled out um, before this, and I think that's what empowered them. Not so much the experience of watching it with an audience, and and I think the majority of the people uh, in the film who we've disguised have not yet seen it. Um, the whole film, they've seen only the sections with them in it, so they don't know, I think, yet what what that experience is going to be like, and whether or not that will detach them in some way from their own stories that is fundamental, but um, I think the, the act of being able to share their story is the act of, of freedom in this instance. And a collective story at that too, something much yeah. bigger than just one piece of it. 
Um, another question from Facebook. Um, what are the biggest lessons for you uh, as you uh, as, as a creator of this? The biggest lesson? That's interesting. Um, and that dog is not my dog, by the way. Um, uh, you know, I think the biggest, certainly the biggest surprise that I had going into this reporting was that I, you know, I knew that I was going into a very dangerous reporting environment. I knew that um, that I was reporting about a, a contemporary genocide of a sort, um, a kind of an evil that is unmatched. And certainly for, you know, my community, the LGBTQ community, is, this is the first time, it, you know, it's a dangerous world to be queer. It's, it's illegal in some 70 countries and um, eight or more um, punish gay people with death. But this is the first time since Hitler that LGBTQ people are being rounded up systematically in a top-down government-controlled campaign of elimination. And, um, and, and I never thought that I would live long enough to see a return to that sort of horror. Um, and that's what I was girding for as I went in to do the reporting. And I think what I was surprised by almost from the start was um, that w what I was seeing was a kind of a love, um, this kind of collective and community love that people were mounting for one another, for strangers, that, you know, the, the motivation for the people like David Esteve and Olga Baranova in the film is, is remarkable that they would take such risks for their own lives to help total strangers and the, the the strength of that they show in their motivation was um i don't know just just blew me away and i realized that it reminded me of some of the narratives that came out of um, nazi germany of people willing to to do the unimaginable ordinary people and uh and i think the the really the lesson that I took away was from them, which is that um, sometimes some people are called upon to do these extraordinary acts and they take that on at whatever peril to themselves. Thank you, David, for this incredible film. And thank you so much for bringing us all into to being able to act with this film as well um, as, as an active viewer, as an as a, as a as part of the process, it's it's really remarkable, and I think the way that you've used that technology uh, to create those layers for us to engage in multiple ways while feeling the humanity of the story is is, is truly remarkable. Thank you so much, and um, we want to also thank the Welcome to Chechnya producer, Alice Henty. You can see the film on HBO. And I want to thank Brandon and Claudia for all the amazing production support today. And it's very complicated, uh, but beautiful behind the scenes take on the film. Also a shout out to our colleagues at Witness. Thank you, Corin, and our sponsors, uh, the Knight Foundation and BuzzFeed and Vimeo. I'm going to pass it over to Sarah now to tell us yeah, more and about also, Thank you so much, David, for this, your incredible work. On behalf of all of Open Doc Lab, it's, it's really remarkable. Um, and thank you, Kat and uh, Corin and everyone for this incredible series. Um, and thank you all out there for joining. Um, and that we hope you'll join us next week at the same time for the next public talk at Open Doc Lab with Robert Hernandez from USC, who's going to talk to us about how he, together with his students, are using new technologies to disrupt journalism. Thank you. And for, and for the next episode of Deep Fakery, we're back on Thursdays, next Thursday, September 17th at noon Eastern time with episode four. It's called Boundary Lines, Deep Fakes Weaponized Against Journalists and Activists. We'll be joined by Samantha Cole from Vice, who first alerted the world to how deep fakes, deep, deep fakes are being used to attack women and non, uh, with non-consensual sexual images. Mega Rajagopalan, uh, she's an international correspondent at BuzzFeed News. 
um, and she's also a specialist in human rights. Uh, we'll also be joined by Nina Schick. It's an all-star panel. She's the author of a new book called Deep Fakes, The Coming Infocalypse, moderated by co-creation studio fellow and journalist Asia Bundawi. So as we say goodbye to you, let's take a look at what we'll be talking about next week. Thank you. Harry Belvani joining us live this morning. Hey, good morning, Harry. Harry, wake up. Harry? Yeah. Wake up, wake up. Okay. <laughs> this is your 